everybody. Um, my name is Kara Hamley O'Donnell, and I am the Historic Preservation Planner for the City of Cleveland Heights. I work in the planning department there. And um, this is our last preservation month. Pres preservation month was in May, but we had so much important stuff to do, we had to kind of spill over into June, which worked out pretty well because um, you know this is the year that Kane Park starts its 75th anniversary, and this is a great way for us to kick that off. Um, before we started, I wanted to make you aware of a, um, a little bit of what's, what our plan is um, this summer to celebrate Kane Park. There are various events going on at the park during the year, but one of the things that's going to happen is you're probably familiar with the Feinberg Gallery. Well, this year, instead of having various art, we're going to have an exhibit on the history of Kane Park. So there will be a lot of um, programs, and uh, one gentleman uh, brought these in from his personal collection and is, is, uh, offered to let us uh, exhibit them at the display. Um, we'll have some mementos from the park's history, and so that will be at the park, the gallery all year, all summer long. We're also, if you have friends who wanted to come to this event and weren't able to get in because we are um, at capacity, uh, we are videotaping this event, which will be played um, at the Feinberg Gallery. So when people come in to see the exhibit, they can um, see some of this exhibit. We also are going to put it on the city's YouTube channel within a week or two. Uh, it will be played on the city cable channel. And then we will also, as we do with all of these lectures that we videotape, put it on a DVD, which will be here at the library. So some of our past lectures um, you can check out and learn a, bit, a little bit about the history. So if you enjoy this and you have friends who you might, might enjoy seeing it, they should I mean, they can check it out here or, or over the internet or on our cable channel. Um, so um, you, we encourage everyone to go to Keene Park this summer and celebrate its history. Um, it's one of those places, at least as a person who's lived in Cleveland Heights for more than 20 years, one of my favorite places to go and to bring people. So um, we're going to learn a little bit about more about its history from Emily. Um, Emily uh, came uh, to the city of Cleveland Heights uh, doing research on her master on her, uh, a subject that she was interested in, which is Kane Park. And then um, it came to the point where we had all these records, which she was digging around in, and they, they weren't very organized. And so um, Emily uh, came in on, on as an intern last summer, or uh, spring, and what her job was was to organize the records, which worked out really well because she needed the records to write her master's thesis on the history of Kane Park. And, she actually uh, wrote a grant, um, and so the state of Ohio, on your little check off on your income tax, helped pay her to organize our Kane Park records. So it worked out really well for the city. So now we can find things in their chronological order, um, which has made things great um, for Emily to do this presentation for us. We also, um, I just was talking to someone today who was interested in writing um, a, a, some, a book that has a little bit of focus on Kane Park as well, and is looking for people to give um, Kane Park memories which I tagged the gentleman who brought the <laughs> posters to, to help us out with, too. So there's always been this interest in Kane Park, and clearly there's a big interest around here. So with that, Emily is um, completed her undergraduate degree with a dual major of historic preservation and interior design at Ursuline College. And then she uh, did her master's degree, which she just graduated last month with, in historic preservation from Ursuline College. And she is now employed full-time as an admissions uh, agent? Admissions counselor. Counselor. <laughs> Um, at Ursuline College. So she's going to share the history of, of Kane Park, and um, we'll leave time at the end for questions, and uh, we'll take it from there. So please welcome Emily. Well, thank you everyone for being here tonight. You know, it's really wonderful to see so much interest in Kane Park. Um, a little bit more about me and how I found Kane Park. I'm not from the Cleveland area, and so I'd really never heard of Kane Park and didn't know anything about it. My first experience at Kane Park was sledding with some friends in the winter. And eventually I returned years later to the art festival. And at that point I was looking for a project for one of my classes and realized, wow, this place is amazing. This would be perfect for my class. <laughs> so at that point I started digging a little more into the history of Kane Park. And that's when I met Kara and started my internship there. But the biggest thing I learned during my internship was that Kane Park meant a lot to a lot of different people. Things have been collected over the years, some for record keeping purposes, but most of it was saved or donated just out of love. People love this place, and it shows.
In order to understand Kane Park, we first have to look at the city in which it's located and a few other movements that influenced the creation of the park, including the public parks movement and the summer, summer stock theater movement. Cleveland Heights was first incorporated as a village. <laughs> yes, Cleveland Heights was first incorporated as a village in 1903. It officially became a city in 1921, but really the history of Cleveland Heights began long before then. Pioneers first began to settle the area in the early 1900s. At that time, the area was still um, very primitive, but settlers stayed because of the rich fertile soil and the ease of quarrying. Considering Cleveland was established in 18. 36, it is surprising to realize that the land adjacent to the city was not really developed until much later. <coughs> that being said, once the area was settled, Cleveland Heights became a very productive area, with some, partly because of the multiple forms of transportation and its proximity to the Cleveland area. Early people used roads, canals, and railroads to transport farm goods that they produced and the stone that they quarried. Homes, farms, and commercial buildings rose throughout the area with farming and quarrying as the main economic activities. Both of these helped bring wealth to the area, but due to changing trends and the influx of Clevelanders into the rural heights, farming became impossible and most of the quarries closed by 1924. Cleveland's population grew rapidly towards the end of the 19th century, and the metropolis became crowded and dirty. The proper, prosperous families of the day decided to build summer homes away from the dirt and the noise in order to escape the industry that had taken over the city. Clevelanders began pushing east and first established Millionaire's Row along Euclid Avenue, but they continued to push east as the city of Cleveland continued to grow. From 1890 onward, Cleveland Heights would be known as the streetcar suburb. Advances in technology, such as the streetcar, made commuting to Cleveland city center much easier for suburbanites. Cleveland Heights flourished as a streetcar car suburb and was home to many prominent Clevelanders, including John D. Rockefeller. Over time, Cleveland Heights experienced several phases of growth and decline. The growing community of Cleveland Heights officially became a hamlet in 1901. Later, the state phased out this designation, and in 1903, the hamlet of Cleveland Heights became the village of Cleveland Heights. At this time, there were about 1,500 residents in the village that can, in, continued to grow. During this time of growth, Cleveland Heights had one mayor, Frank C. Kane. Kane retained this position of mayor for a record 32 years. He was elected in 1914 after serving on the village council. Mayor Kane was a very strong influence throughout the city and was re-elected 18 times. During his last election in 1946, Kane received 81% of the votes. During his tenure, Cleveland Heights established the mayor-city manager style of government, adopted Ohio's first zoning laws, and replaced the streetcar lines with express bus routes. Frank Kane became known as a political force to be reckoned with. Mayor Kane was such a strong force behind the establishment of the city's park system that he even convinced the Rockefellers to donate part of their estate to create more parkland in Cleveland Heights. Later, his influence would also extend to the small park between Lee Road and Taylor Road. Between 1910 and 1940, the population of Cleveland Heights skyrocketed from 3,000 people to 55,000 residents. In 1921, Cleveland Heights officially received city status and was incorporated August 9, 1921. 
During the 60s, the population peaked at 16, or 61,000 residents. Cleveland Heights emerged as a racially, economic, and ethnic, ethnically diverse city, through the trans, though the transition was not easy. Blockbusting was rampant throughout the area, and longtime citizens felt threatened by the changes. Racial tensions and riots affected the Heights, and change was slow to come. Cleveland Heights continues to be predominantly a residential community with 76% of the land dedicated to residential purposes. Currently, over 46,000 people call Cleveland Heights home. What once began as wealthy white suburban village is now a diverse city that boasts over 135 acres of parklands throughout their six city parks. Cleveland Heights was always looking to be at the cutting edge of social and technological innovation. The creation of public parks in Cleveland Heights presented the perfect opportunity to showcase how forward thinking the city was, especially considering creating public green space was a new idea and it was a growing priority for city planners and city um, politicians. Originally, parks did not serve any purpose beyond space. Later, park design changed to accommodate specific purposes, and in 1906, the National Recreation Association was founded. They realized that only 41 cities had public playgrounds. Within 25 years, that number would grow to over 1,000 cities with playgrounds, public swimming pools, tennis courts, and other recreational facilities. Another important movement to Kane Park is the Little Theater or Summer Stock Theater movement. Before the Summer Stock Theater movement, theater was largely based on its European counterparts. This movement was, was really the first of its kind and was a purely American movement within the performing arts. It orig its origins can be traced to the 1910s at vacation resorts, particularly the Providence Town Wharf Theater in Cape Cod, Massachusetts shown here. From here, the movement spread throughout the country into hundreds of small towns. Proving to be both an artistic and financial success, summer stock theaters popped up in rural small town barns and swanky resorts. While they ranged in quality, they provided work for amateur artists and low-cost entertainment for the locals. Although the term summer stock has been loosely employed to refer to any summertime entertainment, technically speaking, it refers to the residential troupe of actors and other stage professionals presenting a number of different plays weekly or biweekly, either in permanent house or on tour between the months of June and September. These theater companies were found predominantly in rural sections of northeastern United States from Maine to Virginia and as far west as Pennsylvania, to, to service vacationers at the newly developed middle and working class resorts of the 1920s and the 1930s. Pretty much wherever city de dwellers would go to escape the heat was where you would find a summer stock theater. Most theaters played once a week stock, offering a different play every week, with seasons usually ranging between eight weeks to 14 or 15 weeks. Many of these plays were revivals of recent Broadway hits so that there was recognition with the audience. But most companies presented comedies, romances, mysteries, and thrillers, so-called light entertainment, though occasionally dramas would happen. For many people, summer stock theaters were their first opportunity to witness professional theater productions. As America's first truly regional theater movement, it had a major effect on the cultural, economic, and sociological development of the United States. Each theater was a unique operation. It reflected the personalities and interests of the producing artists and its supporting community. Between 1930s and the 1960s, summer th stock theaters were the leading employer of theater professionals in the country. Not only did these theaters provide employment for professional actors, there was, it was also a place for amateur artists to build their resume, establish a reputation, and hone their skills. 
Additionally, local economies flourished due to playgoers and their business that they brought to local restaurants and hotels. Even in Cleveland's Plain Dealer, you will find old newspaper ads advertising rooms for rent in Cleveland Heights for the Kane Park actors who were here for the summer. Summer stock theaters became tourist destinations that helped build local economies before and after the Great Depression. The summer stock theater movement ended its heyday in the early 1960s, mainly due to the advent of the television. <laughs> During the golden age of the summer stock theater movement, Dinah Reese Evans began her exploration of theater through a scholarly lens. Evans was born June 19, 1891 in Chicago. She received her bachelor's degree from the University of South Dakota. During the 1920s, she taught language in Montana while pursuing her graduate degree at the University of Iowa. Evans earned her master's degree from the University of Iowa in 1929 after completing her thesis. She came to Cleveland Heights in the 1930s to research a theory for her PhD dissertation entitled Influences of Dramatic Training Upon the Personality. She believed that theater education helped make dramatic transformations in students, attitudes, and social behaviors, as well as help them succeed in other areas. She proved her theory, earned her doctorate in 1932, thus giving her the honor of holding the first doctorate granted for theater in the US. Evans, meanwhile, moved to Cleveland, where she taught English and continued teaching drama at Cleveland Heights High School from 1930 to 1958. Her Heights players grew and an adult theater club also developed in 1932. Circling back a bit, Kane Park was established in 1914 by the city of Cleveland Heights after a $100,000 bond issue was passed by the citizens. This bond established both Kane Park and Cumberland Park. Considering that a small village of less than 3,000 people was willing to pass a $100,000 bond issue in 1914 shows just how important public parks were to these people. In the summer of 1934, two theater groups under the direction of Doc Evans wanted to collaborate on an outdoor production of A Midsummer Night's Dream. Coordinating theater-minded adults with high school dramatic students, Doc Evans produced the, first, the city's first outdoor play presented at the foot of the sledding hill between Kane Park and, or between Taylor and Superior Roads. Needing a name for the performance location, she hastily dubbed it Kane Park after Mayor Frank Kane. Immediately, Mayor Kane proposed an amphitheater complex be built in Kane Park. But there was one major issue, the Great Depression. Being 1934, it was right in the middle of the longest financial depression this country has seen to date. High unemployment rates and drastic um, unemployment rates led to very tr trying times for the United States. With unemployment over 20%, many families were unsure about their future. In order to combat this, Frank D. Frank D. Re Re President Roosevelt established the Work Progress Administration Fund, or the WPA, in 1933. The WPA was one of several re relief programs created under the Emergency Relief Appropriations Act. This public assistance program provided jobs to unemployed Americans building public highways, schools, hospitals, airports, and playgrounds in return for temporary financial assistance. Of the 10 million men without jobs in 1935, the WPA employed 3 million of them. Considering Mayor Kane's goal and the state of the city in 1934, he had a wonderful model to begin work for his amphitheater. Kane reached out to the Cuyahoga County Sailor and Soldiers Relief Commission about using unemployed veterans to help build the complex. They agreed with the idea 
and with funding from the WPA, construction began. Many people in Cleveland Heights were not supportive of the project, including the city council, who nicknamed the project Kane's Folly. Despite this, Kane was anything but deterred. He personally contracted local merchants to strike deals for materials and personally paid for portions of the project. For example, the city council was unwilling to pay for drawing plans or model of the amphitheater complex, so Kane paid for these himself with help from Russell Hector, an engineer student at Case Western, who happened to be the son of the supervisor for all the veteran workers. One local newspaper quoted Mayor Kane as saying, the city had no funds for that, but we did have a few secondhand bricks, some used good lumber, some plumbing supplies, and a little sewer pipe. <laughs> the majority of the construction materials, including wood and stone, came from local sources in order to keep fun costs down. The city also owned a quarry at the time from which the sandstone used throughout the park um, came from for construction and detail purposes. Secondhand bricks were used that were left over from other city projects or bought from demolition crews at discounted rates. Though the county, county, uh, Cuyahoga County Soldiers and Sailors Relief Commission, the Kane Park project employed anywhere from 15 to 200 partially disabled veterans during each of its phases, averaging about 20 workers daily with no cost to the city for their labor. Additionally, the WPA graded and landscaped the ravine while city workers also helped with the transformation. Not only did they build the amphitheater and the surrounding buildings, they helped plant thousands of trees and shrubs donated from John D. Rockefeller's estate, Forest Hill. Over 5,000 shrubs and trees were moved from the estate's nursery to the park with the help of the WPA. But before any construction could begin, workers first had to fill in the creek that was running through the middle of the park, which this picture illustrates them working on that project. The project was complete in 18, or 1938. According to the Cleveland Press, the total cost to the suburb is approximately $6,000 for the project. Experts have estimated it couldn't have been le built less for $75,000. Kane Park would later be recognized as one of the first municipally owned and operated amphitheaters in the country. After the park was complete, Mayor Kane asked Doc Evans, here's your theater. What are you going to do with it? <laughs> she replied, I think we sh it should be a community theater which will provide dramatic training for the youth and inexpensive entertainment for the adults. Doc Evans kept her word and maintained this focus during her 20 years as Kane Park director. The park was dedicated on August 10, 1938. At the dedication, Mayor Kane said, Cleveland Heights is something unique in a theater. There are plenty of outdoor summer theaters, opera courses and open air, but a theater owned and operated by the city for the benefit of its own citizens is without precedent. We are actually making history here tonight. The first production was selected so that a large number of community members could participate in the production. The 1938 season opened with The Warrior's Husband. It continued with three other productions. The following years, in 1939, the season featured eight different productions, doubling their previous season. With Mayor Kane promising to subsidize the park for five years, the following years were a time of growth and exploration for the park and its staff. The park operations were always carried out by the city, meaning the city council or the mayor. Other cities owned theaters, but they were controlled by boards or corporations, not controlled by the city itself. Kane Park was an extension of city government, and even their bills were paid through the city finance department with profits generated from the theater. 
here are a few pictures from some of the 1930s productions. During the 1940s, theatrical seasons averaged about 10 weeks and included adult plays and musicals, as well as children's performances. As stated in Doc Evans' book, the educational aspects of the theater continued to increase importance. There was much more in Kane Park Theater than the physical plan and production. Every phase of the theater was operated from the educational as well as the entertainment standpoint. Our policy was to welcome talented young people who are studying the arts of the theater in the colleges and universities of America. As a result, a remarkable collection of professionally trained men and women brought a continued, <coughs> continually renewed vitality to our productions. In 1941, the season expanded to nine, season, nine weeks with attendance increasing dramatically. Over 63,000 people attended performances and they were able to boast that Kane Park Theater was financially self-sufficient in only four years. A lot of change has seen the following years. On December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor was attacked. The following day, the United States formally entered World War II and the U.S. was changed instantly. All aspects of life, including entertainment at Kane Park, were affected. Their staff decreased significantly as young men enlisted and left for war. Rationing also made set design, lighting, and costume difficult for productions. Despite the difficulties, Kane Park remained open, serving as a distraction for participants and spectators alike. By 1949, interest had declined and, and attendance was down. Eventually, the season was shortened from 10 weeks to eight weeks. Hal Holbrook is right there in the middle. During the 1950s, Kane Park Theater shifted its focus from community theater to more semi-professional productions. Although she continued her work with the Children's Theater, 1950 was Doc Evans' final year as the park's executive director. In 1953, attendance hit a record high of over 100,000 attendees. Despite the high attendance numbers, the theater began to struggle financially. Larger productions with more prominent performers and theater professionals continued to put more strain on the small budget. By 1957, only two plays and a handful of musicals were produced due to budgetary limitations. Across the nation, theaters were struggling. In hopes of sparking more interest in Kane Park, local private interest groups organized concerts. Even with big names like Bob Hope, Sammy Davis Jr., Harry Belafonte, and Johnny Mathis, these concerts were not enough to bring prosperity back to Kane Park. While the main stage may have been struggling, the Children's Theater program was still a very strong and active program on the Alma Theater stage. A few pictures of the Children's Theater. And some from the main productions. Had to include that. <laughs> Just too goofy. Yes, that is a man. <laughs> In the 1960s, the people of Cleveland Heights were struggling to find a niche for Kane Park Theater in a changing world. The Evans Theater sat empty for five years with only the children's productions still um, producing shows. In 1967, Kane Park did not open for its summer season. 
Discussions throughout the city were held to determine what to do with the park. There was talk about demolishing the theater complex in order to build a new city hall, but thankfully that proposal was not successful, mainly because the public still had high hopes to revitalize the theater. In 1968, the theater portions of the park reopened. The new attraction would be Dancing Under the Stars. The 6,600 square foot stage was transformed into a dance floor with seating for over 300 people. During these weekly events, big band music was performed by local and regional favorites while patrons danced on the stage. During dance intermission, they would also project lyrics on a large screen and held community sing-alongs to songs such as School Days, Bicycle Built for Two, and Ain't She Sweet. After seeing the popularity of Dancing Under the Stars, weekly attendance averaging about 1,100 people, Kane Park instituted Rock and Roll Fridays for the teenagers. The Friday night version featured live bands as well. While these weekly events were popular, in 1968, attendance was dismal at the two performances of Oklahoma, the only production of the season. The Kane Park staff decided that stage productions from then on would be held on the smaller Alma Theater versus the large Evans Theater. It would be over 10 years until the Evans the Theater stage would host another production. One of the highlights from the 1960s was the addition of the art gallery to Kane Park. The former Children's Theater Office building, which is pictured here, was adapted to a gallery and studio space. The next year, free arts classes were offered to the public through the art gallery, further expanding the park's reputation as the center for the arts. And a few pictures. <laughs> the same trends continued into the 1970s. It wasn't until 1974 when a group of community-minded citizens formed the Kane Park, Art, Kane Park Theater Association. They began raising funds to bring back live theater to the main stage and to expand the Alma Theater season. Another goal of the group was to improve the facilities of the theaters while also helping the new art gallery grow. At this time, the back two-thirds of seating in the Evans Theater was removed in order to add the lawn area. The city of Cleveland Heights recognized the importance of Kane Park and declared it a local landmark in 1977. In 1978, Kane Park hosted its first annual Kane Park Arts Festival. Eventually, this event would grow, drawing artists from all around the country to the juried show. Today, over 65,000 people attend the festival annually. A final push towards revitalization happened in 1979. The movie Those Lips, Those Eyes was filmed in Kane Park. The film centered around David Shaber's memories of working at Kane Park while growing up in Cleveland Heights. A summary of the movie is as follows. Cleveland, 1951. Pre-med student Artie Shoemaker dreams not so much of a medical career, but a life of the theater against the wishes of his working class parents. Despite having no experience in the theater, he is hired as a props man at the Kempton Hills Park Theater. The resident leading man at Kempton Hills is Harry Crystal, who along with some other more experienced company members is working towards more lucrative and higher profiting acting jobs. It goes on to talk about how Harry coaches um, Artie through the summer season and teaches him how to be a ladies man <laughs> and the life of the theater. It's really not the best movie ever. <laughs> it's not. I did watch it. Not the best. <laughs> but the filming company, United Artists, invested $100,000 in the Evans Theater, which not only made filming possible, 
but also brought live theater back to the main stage. A few pictures from the movie and prop taxis that they brought in for the filming. And then a few pictures from the 1970s productions. The following years would witness a rebirth of Kane Park Theater. New seating was installed, and in 1980, the first major theatrical production was held on the main stage. More renovations happened in 1988 after, after a bond issue was passed. This allowed for a $5 million renovation of the park. Through the 1989 renovations, care was taken to maintain the historic integrity of the buildings throughout the park. The Cleveland architectural firm of Van Dyke, Johnson & Partners was hired to design the canopy that now covers at the Evans Cedar. This is the same architectural company that designed the canopy at Blossom down in um, Cuyahoga Falls. With a roof over the main stage, larger acts could be held without the fear of getting rained out, which happened to be a frequent occurrence. <laughs> Kane Park was once again a staple in the community and boasted crowds compared to those in its heyday. An average of 100,000 patrons attended performances at Kane Park annually. Kane Park has become known as Cleveland Heights Summer Art Park. The park's reputation only continues to grow. <coughs> According to their website, Kane Park attracted aspiring young talents such as Broadway music director Jack Lee, producer Ross Hunter, and the actors Hal Holbrook, Dom DeLuise, Carol Kane, Jack Weston, and Pernell Roberts, who performed on sets designed by nationally acclaimed industrial artist Victor Streckengost, among others. Kane Park is a unique entity. Doc Evans State the theater would be where citizenship and education meet, and the theater assumed a dynamic center for our community life. It will ce celebrate its 75th anniversary in August this year. Performances planned for the summer include Amy Grant, Chris Christofferson, Weird Al Yankovic, and local favorites including Michael Stanley, Big Bad Voodoo Daddy, and Michael McDonald. Additionally, they will also have their arts festival. In conclusion, Kane Park is more than just an amphitheater. Its unique history and unchanged focus has made this place noteworthy. More importantly, Kane Park has changed the lives of thousands of people. The actors performing on stage, college students during internships, the stage hands behind the scenes, the families sledding down the hills, the children attending the children's theater school, and locals sitting in the seats. No one summarizes it better than a former Kane Park student. If one sits in the main amphitheater, those voices from the past echo around the natural ravine where the theater was built. The visions of the former actors, the bright lights, the beautiful costumes, the dances, the sound of the music, the laughter, are still seen there. Even the presence of the 3,000 and more people who would come each night to see the performances can still be felt. Kane Park is more than just a memory. <laughs>